In addition to this, these really important developments in science and technology and sort of a logical, rational approach to the physical world, the Italian Renaissance also gives us a time where the humanist and secularist approach to philosophy and thought um, are resurrected from the Greek and Roman days, right? Um, and here we've got images of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, the teachings of these three guys, but also lots and lots and lots of other Greek and Roman philosoph philosophers come back and provide some complexity to the way that the Italian Renaissance people think about themselves and about the world. As we noticed in the medieval era, religion pretty much says you are a tiny cog in the machine. You need to shut up and do your job. Um, and humanism as a mode of thought, humanism as it develops in the Italian Renaissance, is this resurrection of ideas of Greece and Rome that say, to some degree anyway, you aren't just a cog in the machine your own individual experiences, insights, and understanding of the world matters. And it matters outside of religion. Again, the major philosophers and thinkers of Greece and Rome, certainly they lived in a heavily religious society, but their writings were not about religion. So the notion that there is legitimate and complex philosophical knowledge uh, and wisdom outside of the Bible and that people matter outside of religion is a really huge step forward and one of the reasons why we have a, an explosion of free thought in the Italian Renaissance. So the humanistic part of that is that you, the individual, matter. The secularistic part of that and secularism, that just simply means functioning outside of the church and outside of religion. Secular just means non-religious. So this notion of humanism and secularism um, are really key ideas in a bunch of different ways. One of the most important ones is the development of the notion of university learning, specifically of the liberal arts. Uh, and so what I talk about when I talk about that, and here on the left you see uh, an image of one of the universities of Padua, this is a dissection slash surgical arena where students would learn about the anatomy of the human body and very crude surgical procedures. Uh, and then uh, the, the image on the right there is the University of Bologna, which was one of the most famous and prestigious universities of the time. But uh, Italy is essentially a nation of universities uh, during the Renaissance. And as uh, um, the rich people of Europe send their kids to Italy to get educated, they are learning a particular approach to education. And again, this is something we talk about a lot, and you hear this, you hear this word thrown around in college quite a lot. It's a liberal arts approach to education. And this is simply the idea that college or university education is not job training. A lot of universities in Europe at this time specifically focus on job training. You either went to become a doctor, a lawyer, or a member of the clergy. Uh, and so it was really professionally focused. The liberal arts approach shifts that and says, we're going to teach you about the world in general, and we're going to make you capable of engaging in the civic life of your community and considering the best actions that you and your community can execute moving forward. Basically, these are people who are really good at lots and lots and lots of things. Uh, grammar, rhetoric, history, poetry, philosophy, broad-minded education. And these liberal arts approaches to education give us what we know as the Renaissance man. That is, these genius people who are good at lots and lots and lots of different things, not just one thing. So we look at da Vinci and Michelangelo as two quintessential examples um, of the Renaissance man, right? Michelangelo is an artist who is well-versed in a variety of media and techni techniques. Da Vinci, a guy who's not only an extremely accomplished artist, but is also a scientist and can build the machines that he sketches out and is um, a thinker in a, a variety of different really complex modes. So what we're dealing with here is the notion that you go to college to learn for the sake of learning. And that secular humanist approach in the universities is tremendously important to creating this broad-minded individual who becomes the Renaissance man. Now, how does the Catholic Church feel about all of this? Well, surprisingly, the Italian Renaissance is characterized by quite a lot of religious tolerance. And that is a huge factor that allows the Renaissance to be as explosive and amazing as it was. Because you can imagine religious thought and secular thought conflict quite a lot, especially if everyone's running around digging up these Greek and Roman thinkers and uh, documents and ideas. Those are from a very heretical era where pagan worship of much many different gods would be a huge problem for the Catholic Church. So there's an opportunity for, let's just see, here's a pope, right? For a pope to come down and shut this whole thing down and censor it. 
two particular reasons why the church doesn't just simply um, censor and destroy the blooming of the Italian Renaissance. One is a really easy, straightforward one, and that's money. As the Renaissance explodes through this uh, blossoming of culture comes a blossoming, blossoming of economy. If all the rich kids of Europe are being sent to university in Italy, that's going to make your nation some money. If people like da Vinci are churning out new ideas and new concepts, if Galileo is building a telescope that you can now sell, if we're creating better technology to do a better job of trading with other nations, all of that makes a lot of money. And any time that a church is going to be able to look at something and say, well, all right, all this learning you're doing means actually you're making a whole lot of money for the church. And as we noticed, not only are you making money for the church, you're also being able to build really enormous churches that look larger and cooler and glorify God in a more amazing way than ever before. So that's one of the clear reasons that the church says, OK, we're not going to censor all this Greek and Roman obsession. We're going to let it go. Um, the wealthier the nobles get. The more money the nobles tithe or give to the church, the more wealthy the church gets. So it's good for everybody. Again, there's a very financial orientation uh, to my uh, sort of analysis of history here, but it certainly makes sense. There's another key thing that happens early on in the Renaissance, which really helps this out. As you may notice, there's a little bit of a conflict between what we'll call religious logic or miracles and what develops and becomes a big deal in the Renaissance, Aristotelian logic or science. Here's what I mean by this and why I chose the picture of Noah's Ark. Religious logic says basically God can do whatever he wants to. So, for instance, God can build a boat of a certain dimension that will hold every animal on earth a pair of them, and be able to take them away for 40 days and hold their food and be able to, uh, you know, shovel all their excrement over the side and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Scientifically, Noah's Ark is impossible. There are all sorts of scientifically impossible things that happen throughout the Bible. Aristotelian logic, which requires this very rational notion of observation, hypothesis, and conclusion, and Aristotelian logic, which says you can only prove something if you can repeat it. Eh, you're not going to be able to repeat any of the miracles that happen in the Bible. These two things conflict very clearly and pose potentially a huge problem for the Renaissance because from a scientific standpoint, again, nothing in the Bible, uh, none of the miracles in the Bible are repeatable. The church makes a very important decree early on in the Renaissance that says, ah, all right, we can have both at the same time. They exist in different realms. Science exists here on the earth. Religious logic is just fine for God, and it happened in the Bible, and they can both happen at the same time. This seems like a minor distinction, but it's a really big deal because if somebody is working to scientifically analyze the events of the Bible, the church is going to get pretty annoyed with that, and there's going to be censorship and huge problems. So this is just kind of a historical side note of something that becomes really tremendously important for allowing the Renaissance to continue moving forward. So let's sum it up. The Renaissance is an era of logic and rationality and technology with all the different kinds of science and scientists that are working in a variety of different ways. You, the individual, you matter. And that humanist secularist approach is going to inform a lot of the plays, pretty much every play that we read in other societies from here on forward, right? We'll look at Spain and France and England and see that humanism and secularism become a real focus and we get away from these crappy, terrible morality plays. One of the ways we develop playwrights in this era and complex audiences who can really think in depth about these things is this emphasis on university learning. The idea that you should learn a lot about a lot of different subjects rather than just simply go to school to get job training. And that university learning over the course of the rest of the Renaissance will spread throughout Europe and really change how Europe thinks about and develops thought, art, philosophy, culture, etc. The whole religious tolerance thing, this is a little bit of an up and down kind of thing. Um, at Later on in the Renaissance, the Catholic Church cracks down a little bit on a handful of things. But by and large, the Renaissance is allowed to flourish because the church says, all right, it's OK, it'll work out. The result from all of this is starting from Italy and spreading gradually throughout Europe, this explosion of all of these amazing things that really characterize the Renaissance art, architecture, knowledge, curiosity, and a love for all things Greek and Roman. And as we'll talk about later with France, an almost obsessive love for all things Greek and Roman. If they did it, well, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it just like they did it. A lot of positives to that, a handful of drawbacks, but we'll get to that later. This would be a good opportunity to make an annotation on any of these things at any point in the lecture. And we'll continue in a moment with segment two.